Today, I'm going to focus this homily on Hagar, and we're going to dig into the details. Hagar is a really interesting biblical character because she talks so directly with God. However, let's begin with her social position. Hagar is a woman, she is a foreigner among the Israelites, and she is enslaved. The name Hagar means alien or sojourner. Her name further points us to understanding that Hagar is an outsider. In this context, she is an oppressed minority. In her daily life, she is mistreated because of her social position. To understand today's Genesis 21 passage, we need to back up a bit and talk about Genesis chapter 16. So in today's reading, we hear Sarah's command to cast Hagar and Ishmael out. However, this is not the beginning of Hagar's story. In chapter 16, Sarah directs Abraham to have a child with Hagar. When Hagar discovers her pregnancy, she looks with contempt on her mistress, Sarah. Sometimes readers interpret that moment as Hagar expresses superiority. But I think it is actually anger. In the biblical text, Sarah decides Abraham will have sex with Hagar in an attempt to bear a son. Hagar is not consulted. Thus, her anger and contempt for Sarah is entirely justified. When Hagar expresses anger about her mistress and master taking advantage of her, Abraham tells Sarah, your slave girl is in your power. Sarah deals harshly with her and the abused Hagar runs away into the wilderness. In Genesis 16, the pregnant Hagar is in a place where she has no good options. She either returns and submits to her abusive mistress, Sarah, or she goes into the harsh desert wilderness, under-equipped and unlikely to survive. In the entire Hagar narrative, Abraham is conflicted and ambivalent, and he seems unwilling to protect the mother of his child. So here is what happens during the Genesis 16 passage when the pregnant Hagar is in the wilderness. She cries out to God, and God promises Hagar, the oppressed, the woman, and the slave, the same that he promises to Abraham. God tells Hagar, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. Remember, Hagar has just run away from a place where she is not valued. She has run away from a community that does not see her as a person who matters. At least, she doesn't matter as much as Abraham and Sarah and Isaac. As an undervalued and mistreated person, she cries out to God. And God gives Hagar a specific promise of life abundant. Of course, God understands that the life of each person matters, Isaac's, Abraham, and Sarah's too. But here in this text, God is clarifying that Hagar's life and Ishmael's life specifically matter. God's promise to Hagar comes because Hagar's community doesn't value her life. In Genesis 16, in response to God's promise, something incredible happens. Hagar named the Lord who spoke to her, you are El Roy, for she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Hagar names God. She sees God and remains alive. This is a stunning biblical moment. Normally, humans do not use a specific name for God because God's name is too sacred to be uttered. Hagar's name for God, El Roy, means God sees. Hagar is the only person in the entire biblical canon to name God. Her name for God is an expression of joy in being seen and heard. So now we come to today's reading, Genesis 21. Hagar's son Ishmael plays. Cast Hagar and Ishmael out, Sarah says. She doesn't want her own son to have to share with the son of Abraham's slave woman. 
She does not see Ishmael as someone equally deserving as her own son. In other words, Sarah wants to preserve resources for her own child, her child who is in the majority population of her community, the Israelites. She will ensure that Isaac's privilege is solid by casting out of the community the slave mother and the son. So Abraham gives Hagar and Ishmael a bit of food and water and sends them on their way. It is easier for Abraham to just send them away than to do anything about their status in his community. Now, I want to point to the meaning of the name Ishmael. Ishmael means God hears. In this passage, in the story of Hagar, God sees and God hears the powerless. Essentially, God recognizes that Hagar's life matters. God recognizes that Ishmael, his life matters as well. The Israelites do not believe that Hagar and her son's lives matter. Sarah actively works against Hagar and Ishmael's lives mattering. At first, Hagar's body is there to perform a service. And then when Sarah believes that they are a threat to her own power and to the resources available to her son, she ensures that they are cast out of the community. Abraham does not seem to hold an actively harmful attitude towards Hagar and Ishmael. In fact, he is conflicted because Ishmael is his son. However, he also does not protect them. He shrugs his shoulders. In doing the bare minimum, he too communicates that Hagar and Ishmael's lives don't matter all that much. Sarah and Abraham's actions offer a window into two different kinds of complicity in oppressive situations. One of the ways to think about our own complicity in contemporary oppression is to consider how we actively and passively support injustice. Hagar, as an ethnic minority, a woman, and a slave, is on the receiving end of a lot of violence and injustice. Her society communicates that her life doesn't matter very much. Sarah actively upholds this system of injustice. She abuses Hagar, she belittle her, belittles her, she casts her out. However, Abraham passively upholds the system of injustice. He will not intervene to advocate or for or protect Hagar. He has some conflicted feelings because Ishmael, his son, is his son. He allows Sarah to keep mistreating Hagar. Your slave girl is in your power. I think Abraham is so complicit in Hagar's oppression that even God has given up on hoping Abraham might become an advocate for his own son. After all, God says to Abraham, just do what Sarah says and I will make sure Hagar and Ishmael are taken care of. So Abraham gives Hagar and Ishmael the bare minimum for a little bit of survival in the wilderness. But Abraham cannot understand his own complicity or responsibility in Hagar's enslavement and mistreatment. Let's make a parallel here. The story of Hagar provides some excellent biblical and theological guidance as we shape a response to police brutality specifically and to racial injustice broadly that is grounded in our faith tradition. Hagar's story clearly demonstrates why phrases such as all lives matter cannot be a Christian response. To say all lives matter or to suggest that police brutality is a matter of a few bad apples is to be like Abraham in this story. It is to ignore that the community's structure is set up so that certain lives matter less than others. When Abraham says, your slave girl is in your power to Sarah, he is saying, this is just the way the system works. When we say all lives matter, blue lives matter, or police conduct is just a matter of a few bad apples, we are saying the same thing. We are saying, this is just the way the system works. 
these phrases uphold a system that enacts consistent violence on black people. They accept the way the system works. Our faith response must be one, must be one that protects black lives proactively. It is inadequate to suggest that police officers who kill black people, such as George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, should be held accountable without also affirming the absolute necessity of reforming police to better fund community services. Like Abraham, that is to give someone a little bit of food or water and send them on their way. To say, get rid of the bad apple, but keep everything else about the police the same is to be Abraham. That doesn't do anything about the larger situation that ends in the deaths of many black people at the hands of police. Let's return for a moment to Hagar's plea to God from our reading today. Do not let me look upon the death of the child. Hagar lifted up her voice and wept. Here in today's lectionary reading is a mother pleading, do not let me look upon the death of the child. We hear these same words said again and again in our own day. When we see protests and hear chants of Black Lives Matter, I can't breathe, and no justice, no peace. Remember Hagar pleading, do not let me look on the death of the child. Imagine for a moment that Hagar cried out to God, saying that her child's life was in peril, and God replied, all lives matter. Think about how dismissive that would have been. Hagar lives in a community that does not value her life or her son's. Her child's life is in direct danger in the desert. The important thing here for God to do is to affirm specifically that Hagar and Ishmael's lives matter, and then for God to take action that affirms her life's value. When her child's life is in danger and she is in peril in the wilderness, God not only tells but also shows her that her life and her son's are deeply valued. God's response to Hagar shows us why today we must set aside any instinct to say all lives matter and instead with words and actions change our communities to ensure the value of black lives. It's really important that in our lectionary reading today, we notice that God specifically affirms the life and value of Hagar and Ishmael. God understands that the Israelite community doesn't value them much. And instead of insisting that all lives matter, God states that their lives specifically do. Hagar cries out to God, do not let me look upon the death of the child. God hears. God responds, do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. God does not simply ensure that her child survives. God changes the whole system, bringing into being a great nation where the life of Hagar's child is the beginning of the life of an entire community. Talking about race is often uncomfortable and hard, especially for white people. Talking about race requires continual learning and growth on the part of all of us. Me, you, your friends, children, parents, colleagues. I want each of us to reflect today on where are we on the journey towards understanding race and acting for racial justice? Maybe we have been troubled by the racism we see, but haven't known what to do about it yet. Maybe you're in a place where before you recognized that individuals can behave in racist ways, and now you are starting to understand that racism is built into policing, education, and other institutions in our society. 
maybe you were in a place having said that all lives matter and now are starting to understand why it's time to say Black Lives Matter. I imagine many of us are probably uncomfortable. I know I am. But even amid discomfort, we are all called to grow and learn to listen and to act. Working for racial justice is a core biblical command. It is part of our baptismal covenant. Our nation does not act as though black or other minority lives have as much value as white lives. As we see in the story of Hagar, affirming that these lives matter is wholly God-given work. God sees and hears Hagar and Ishmael, even when Abraham and Sarah do not. Just as God does, we too are called to hear, to see, and to value the Hagar and Ishmaels of our own day. Do not be Abraham who passively supports an oppressive, oppressive culture because he cannot imagine another way. Do not be Sarah who actively supports an oppressive culture because she wants to preserve resources for herself and her son. Instead, we are called to do the holy work that God models in this passage. See, hear, and act. Just as God calls, tells us that Hagar and Ishmael's lives matter, so too are we as the church called to see, to hear, and to enact Black Lives Matter. Amen.